Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel on global trends in the youth movement with Tom Periello, David Kitching, Dorian Warren, and moderated by Layla Zaden. same issues that she mentioned, but on a global level. And we have one more panelist joining us in just a few minutes. He's running a couple minutes late. My name's Leila Zaden. I'm the communications director at Generation Progress. And over the past couple of years, Generation Progress has had meetings with youth organizers, international think tanks, nonprofits, and policymakers from dozens of countries around the world, all with the goal of building power for millennials on a global level. We know that the challenges that our generation faces here are not uniquely American challenges. Things like, as Senator Warren just mentioned, access to affordable higher education, uh, youth unemployment, economic instability, fair elections, civic participation. These are things that people face all around the world. Um, and we know also that governments are trying and struggling to find issue, or solutions to these issues. And at the same time, young people are taking matters into their own hands and mobilizing to see real progressive change on their own. Um, and so we have a great panel here today to talk about some of these issues, expand on the idea of, are millennials really apathetic if they're doing all of this on their own to make progressive change? Um, and hopefully we have some time at the end to take some questions from Twitter. So if you guys tweet at me with uh, the hashtag make progress, we'll see if we can squeeze a couple of questions in at the end. And so I have David Kitchen, Dorian Warren, and Tom Periello will be joining us in just a few minutes. Um, so the first question is for you. How do the feelings that young people in the U.S. have towards their political system compare to some of the feelings that you're seeing young people have in other countries around the world? Thank you. Well, the Millennial Dialogue survey that we've been working on with AudienceNet and the Foundation for European Progressive Studies and the Center for American Progress, um, it, it, it began with the premise that there's too much conjecture in discussion of millennials, that too many... Uh, too many journalists lo using loose cliches imply that millennials are lazy, apathetic, disinterested. And we thought it's better to actually go and properly question this with decent empirical primary research. So we're in the middle of a, of a program of surveys that's now extending to 15 countries in North America and Europe. And it's, it's been a real journey of education and uh, it's sort of an embrace of of what, what it is to be a millennial from the horse's mouth. I'm a millennial myself, and so I've a vested interest in this. Um, just looking com comparatively between American millennials and their counterparts in Europe and in Canada, um, there's, there's certain commonalities. We didn't just go straight into asking about politics. We also wanted to see where politics fit, fit into the overall narrative of a young person's life in the 21st century. So young Americans tend to be interested in music, film, uh, in gaming and technology, just like most of their other counterparts. Uh, w when it came to political issues, the uh, concerns were the same. Uh, it was jobs, education, healthcare. Elizabeth Warren pretty much covered all of that earlier. Um, but, uh, I, but then there were notable uh, differences. Um, you know, American millennials tended to be uh, more, more religious than their counterparts elsewhere, for example. Um, there tended to be a greater focus on, on defense matters. Uh, but this, this corresponded to maybe, a Pol we did surveys in Poland and Bulgaria, and that with their pro proximity to, to Russia, there were also higher incidences of concern with, with defense matters there. But broadly speaking, it's a pretty progressive generation on LGBT matters, gender recognition, all, all of these kind of things. And that, that went across the board. We've, we've completed 10 countries and five more to go. And overall, we found that the aspirations of this generation, both in the US and elsewhere, they're not very different from previous generations. You know, people just want to be able to live well, to, be, to, to not be encumbered with unsustainable debt, uh, to, you know, to, be able, to be able to retire without fear of poverty. 
and that's nothing, nothing new compared to our, our forebears, but perhaps our understanding of it is slightly different in the means by which one engages with the political system. And there is a sense that um, the institutions of politics are not functioning for the 21st century. You know, I've used the comparison before that uh, if, if, you were, if you were offered to take a long journey on a steam train, you'd think that's a pretty stupid question, you know. It, it, but parliamentary democracy and the institutions of modern day politics were invented around the same time as a steam engine. Yeah. And yet we're still using more or less the same structures today. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I just want to welcome Tom Perriello to the stage right now, too. He just arrived. Yeah. Fashionably late. <laughs> um, well, great. That's, that's a great transition to um, my next question in that, you know, the maybe the systems that are set up are kind of outdated, but the issues and the challenges that have resulted from uh, these systems are kind of common. And um, we know that the issues that a young person faces in one part of the world um, is you know, very similar to an issue that a young person faces in another corner of the globe. Um, I think something that a lot of people in this room probably know is that uh, mil millennials around the world are looking for work and there are um, millions upon millions of young people who are out of a job. Um, what do you all think about if there is a global youth employment and unemployment crisis, um, and what are we doing to address it, especially in places like Africa and Asia where uh, unemployment is especially high? Yeah. So, uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there's coffee outside, apparently, in case they're at your tables. Um, so, some people would call you the lost generation. Are you the lost generation? <laughs> Thank you, that's a little better. Uh, let me read you what the Pope says about the crisis of global youth unemployment. He said a couple years ago, it is one of the most serious evils that afflicts the world these days. And he puts it alongside the loneliness of the old. So essentially, our leaders have failed all of us. Now, Tom and I are just on the edge of, I don't think we're officially millennials, we're, we're, we're like, right, we're close, but, but so it's not our fault. But our leaders have... <laughs> Our leaders have failed us, and this is a crisis of leadership, of political leadership around the world, especially if Layla mentioned millions of young people around the world are unemployed. It's something on the magnitude of 200 million unemployed youth around the world. If we were to go country by country, if you go to Spain, the unemployment rate is over 50%. Egypt, I think it's close to 60. Many countries, it's somewhere between 25 and 60% unemployment. So actually, for those of you in the US, you have it really good. I know it doesn't feel like that. But that also translates into how people see the future. So let me give you, I brought some numbers with me. This is from Pew's 2014 Global Attitude Survey. And the question was around, do you think success in life is determined by forces outside your control? Do you believe success in life is determined by forces outside your control? Now, 43% of American millennials say yes. But in Germany and Italy, 63% feel like they have no control. In Greece and Poland, 62%. In France, 54%. In Spain, 48%. Actually, the country that's most optimistic in terms of millennials is the UK at the, only 37%. feel like their forces outside their control that will determine their fate. So this is linked to the question of employment. And as we know, if you're not employed between the ages, say, of 16, especially in 24, if you can't get your first job, not only does that affect your life trajectory, but it also influences government revenues, right? How are we gonna pay off all your student debt if we are not collecting revenue from you in terms of working? So this is a global crisis, it's an American crisis, and we need new leadership to really tackle these, and I think we just heard from someone who is part of that new leadership that's gonna tackle this crisis, but it is a global problem. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think Tom definitely, with his work at the State Department, can speak a little bit to uh, how we're working both as the U.S. and with our partners in other countries um, to solve some of these issues. And uh, Tom, I'm going to read you a tweet. Uh, ben Affleck tweeted at you last week, and he said, thanks, THX, because he's hip, <laughs> thanks for, at John Kerry, thanks for appointing Tom Periello as Special Envoy, Africa, Great Lakes, and DRC. We're looking forward to working with him. So you, you have Ben Affleck pumped on Twitter. Why are people so excited about this new job? Uh, yes, this was my uh, 
Us Weekly debut, actually, which covered the tweet because uh, it was the first since the divorce. Apparently, that was a bigger headline grabber than he the, broke his silence than the Congo element uh, of this, uh, despite uh, obviously ongoing um, very uh, difficult human conditions there. No, it was an honor to be asked, and uh, Ben Affleck has been a great voice. And there was a period a few years ago where it seemed like everyone was talking about Africa. It was kind of cool for a while, and that's faded a little bit. So the people who've stuck with it and really continue to shine a light on an area where we see uh, levels of gender-based violence that blow one's mind, uh, continuing issues of poverty uh, and instability, uh, and particularly for young people in the region, just tremendous, uh, tremendous threats uh, on a daily basis, but also opportunities. And we always want to be sure uh, with Central Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to be honest about the terrible things going on, but also remember that they're great heroes there uh, in civil society, in some cases public servants who are going out every day, and it's often women in communities risking their lives to protect their communities. So we want to make sure that we're honest about the terrible things going on, but also uh, remember that there are really amazing people there that we can hold up and, and champion with. And, uh, you know, I think, again, you see certain things that are distinct from one country to the next, uh, but other things that unite young people around the world, and you mentioned one of them. People want basic security. They want jobs. In some countries, as we know, not having a job means you're not going to get married because you're not going to be able to bear, you know, buy your own house. And you're not doing a lot of dating until you get married. So, you know, the incentives can be pretty high uh, when unemployment starts to... to tack up. Uh, here, obviously, it's that question of whether you might be able to pay off your loans. I remember when I was living in Sierra Leone 15 years ago, and someone asked me how I'd made it to law school and how I'd afforded it, and I said, well, I'm $85,000 in debt. And uh, the person said, you may be technically the poorest person in Sierra Leone, um, <laughs> which is obviously an uh, absurd thing in any human uh, context, but in the reality of what we know it means to be carrying heavy, uh, heavy amounts of student debt. And then we know the inclusivity issue, which is often even where employment might be an option for young men or young men of a particular uh, color or ethnic group, uh, women may be getting left out of that economy. Minorities may be getting left out of that economy. So one of the things that I've seen at both the State Department and USAID, and I think you've seen it here domestically as well, is this emphasis on inclusive economic growth. Uh, while GDP and macro growth is important, it's one thing we track. If we really want to look at reducing human suffering and increasing human flourishing, if we want to look at the things that interest us as human beings, but even frankly from a national security perspective, we have to make sure that's inclusive economic growth uh, defined writ large. And I think young people are helping to define the fact that that is the important frame we should be using. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think another thing that kind of helps with that economic growth, especially in the past couple of decades, has been the emergence of technology as a new, um, you know, a new outlet that we rely on both uh, as a means of communication as well as a means of organizing and even earning a living. Um, and we've seen it inspire great action from, uh, you know, being a platform for the Arab Spring to people earning a living driving cars for Uber. Um, and so how do you all see technology playing a part in this uh, kind of global development, finding solutions to the challenges that maybe government isn't providing for young people? Want to take that? Yeah, well, in some respects, you know, like, like any previous technological advancement, the, the science is somewhat neutral. It can be used for good or ill. Um, you know, and we've seen, I have, a, I have an Egyptian friend who, when the Arab Spring broke out, I knew her from my time li living in Belgium, and I would, never, I would never have thought of her as a natural revolutionary. But um, I was just so impressed to watch her on Facebook and Twitter when the Arab Spring broke out and people were going to Tahrir Square. And she was organizing groups to meet at different metro stations in the outskirts of Cairo and bringing groups of them in so that they could, they could go, go in these groups to keep themselves safe, to keep each other safe. And I really saw the power of, uh, of social media in that kind of context. And I was, you know, she, overnight she went from being this person who was clearly very intelligent, but only partially politicized, to an organizer and to a, a really genuine activist who, who, who um, worked in that context. But on the other side of things, we see the sort of uh, tendency towards public shaming on social media. Uh, wherein, you know, we, we've kind of reverted to this type of mob justice that might have been seen in, in, in more, more puritanical times. And, for, you know, the anonymity that certain types of social media offer you, it provides a charter for cowardice and bullying. 
Uh, so, we, and I don't think the, the tr traditional style of lawmaking that we have will necessarily ameliorate that. That's something we have to talk about as societies in general. There's one thing from our survey. There was a peculiar um, diversion between Canada and the US on, on the place of social media in politics. Uh, for Canadians, uh, Canadian millennials rather, the, the lack of uh, interest in politics was explained by the fact that there are so many different distractions uh, and so, social media among them that people just couldn't be really bothered getting involved in politics. For the US, by contrast, social media were the means by which you engage. And it, just, it, it just thought it would be an interesting thing to tell you about you and your nearest neighbour. <laughs> that, that, um, that, that there are these divergences over, of opinion over how, how technology will develop. There, there, just to be Debbie Downer for one second. There, there is one issue with technology, because it, Dave is right, it, it is neutral in a sense, but in terms of employment, there are some researchers who would argue the robots are coming. And so there, there's a, an Oxford study from about two years ago that looked at the US economy and makes a very provocative claim that up to 47% of current jobs in the US can be robotized. 47% of current jobs in the US economy can be robotized. Foxconn that makes, in China, the big factory that makes our, for some of us, Apple products and other electronics, they ordered, I think, 1.2 million robots to take the place of workers in those factories, mostly young workers. So on the one hand, you might think, oh, this is dire and a huge problem. On the other hand, I'd rather have robots in sweatshops than humans. So we have to reimagine what we think about work in the long term. We have to reimagine, if we think out to 2030, what kinds of jobs will we want to create? What kind of jobs will we be able to do? What kind of skills will we need? Robots do break down, after all, right? So what, what will our economy look like? What are the jobs we want robots to do versus the jobs that we need human beings ultimately to do that involve critical faculties and a range of other things? It is a long-term concern, but we have to start thinking about this problem now. And it's up to you to start thinking about this problem because, as I said earlier, our current generation of leaders aren't even thinking about this as a problem. Unfortunately, I want to echo that uh, in terms of things that keep me up at night, the disruptive uh, impacts of automation on employment, and frankly, the disruptive potential is far greater overseas than in the United States because we've already seen on a slightly more gradual basis the loss of some of the mass employment sectors. Um, so it's certainly there, but uh, none of us uh, are Luddites here, is Luddites here, so you know, the question is how to make it work, and I do think that a new generation can think uh, in, in much more transformative ways about how we might understand employment, how we might understand equality and growth. The other thing that I'll just note is, uh, and I think we've all probably experienced this, at least witnessed it, those who've, of us who've crossed over from the advocacy world into governing certainly have felt this, which is so far I think progressives in particular have been more effective at using technology in an oppositional space than in a governing space. Um, and governing is really important. Good governance is incredibly important. The strategic review I just did for the State Department, we actually had a 400% increase in references to corruption and accountable governance because of how central it is underneath so many of the issues we care about, whether it's gender-based violence, whether it's growth, whether we're talking about human rights, et cetera. So I think one of the challenges for all of us, and you've certainly seen some very creative efforts at this within the Obama administration overseas, you saw some of this dichotomy with the Arab Spring context as well with, you know, being easier to protest than not. We, you, know, you saw other movements struggle with it. So I think one of the great challenges is gonna be how can we bring that same dynamism and the upsides of open source uh, technology into that governing space, which as someone trying to do it is really friggin' hard. Yeah, and there are definitely a lot of countries out there doing it a lot better than the US. Um, and so our challenge is to learn from them and apply it here and um, definitely broaden, I think, the access to internet to allow those kinds of imaginings um, to happen across the world, or across the country, excuse me, and the world. Why not? Can I just add, actually, yeah. that, that triggers another thing. I think one of the upsides that's sort of a burden on all of us, but it's a positive burden, um, is that social media and technology means we don't have excuses anymore for not being aware of terrible things going on around the world and in our own communities. Uh, I think you've seen this some with... Uh, <laughs> 
I, I think this has been at least some of the factor in seeing uh, some of the police brutality issues come up here. Um, but, you know, I was reading, rereading recently King Leopold's Ghost about the creation of the Belgian Congo, because I'm working on those issues now. And you think about, uh, it was, shouldn't have been an excuse then, but it's certainly not now. Again, whether it's parts of our own communities, just other parts of Washington, D.C., other parts of Virginia, or other parts of the world, there are people out there screaming online about those things that are going on, and we need to use our structural empowerment and everyone in this room, to, no matter what your background is, you're now in a position of structural privilege to use that to make sure we're giving voice to those who, who have less of that access. And so how do young people kind of get involved in, you know, another county, another state, another country when they see something that they want to help fix? What are, what are the mechanisms that we have in place to uh, facilitate that kind, of, that kind of understanding and assistance? First of all, technology in of itself is not, a, is not a panacea. You know, it's been a concern that's raised by a lot of people that people think that collectivism is enough. It's not. You know, just saying you like something on Facebook uh, because you think it's a worthy cause doesn't really further the cause very much uh, beyond making you feel better in that immediate moment. But um, you, can, you can harness that to communicate and to organize with people in other parts of the world. It, you know, even... Um, I flew home recently to vote in the equal marriage referendum in Ireland and um, it was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen and it was one of the most emotional and heartwarming weekends I've ever had at home um, where you know, we, we were organising lifts, I'm from a rural part of the country but I had to fly into Dublin and we were organising lifts for people from all over the country via social media. You know, so, this was using social media to have an actual impact on the ground. People who, for whatever reason, couldn't get to the more remote parts of the country were, were, were able to harness this. So, ultimately, just saying I like something or retweeting something will, will never cut it. It's, it's all very well, but if you, can make it, if you can make it move on the ground, if you can make it turn into a knock on the door or a conversation with someone to try and change your mind or to, or to bring them with you, that's, that, that's where it becomes a tool for leadership. And uh, this is a question we just got in from Twitter. Um, Lara asks, I want to change the narrative about helping developing nations to collaborating with active citizens. Where do I start? Uh, so that, you know, that kind of follows on the, the theme of, like, you know, how do people help? How do they get involved? Yeah, just echoing that, I think that um, it's really uh, useful to make the transition from... Uh, from say a, a tweet or a like situation to a conversation and it goes to this point. Um, I think when we enter into these um, partnerships, again, whether it's across say a racial line inside the United States uh, or whether it's across an ocean, dialogue matters, showing up matters. And showing up it's a little harder when you're going uh, across borders, particularly some borders, uh, but it's not impossible, you know, the difference even between Twitter and Skype on this, not to be doing endorsements for particular technologies. Uh, but, uh, you know, getting into a richer, more robust conversation, showing up, I mean, one of the things that's always been useful for me um, is showing up assuming that I have more to learn than I have to teach. It's cliche, but it's really true. Um, but unfortunately, it's also true that sometimes uh, you're getting hustled too. So it's not, you know, you can't also just have the first person you meet from Community X and assume that they, uh, you know, they speak with that validity. So uh, there are things you can do easily, and that's an important part of activism. Um, it is great to sign a petition or to make a phone call now and then. Uh, but deeper engagement is really valuable where you can triangulate and build uh, more robust relationships over time uh, and learn a lot in the process. Yeah, I would just add technology is definitely a means to an end because, I mean, just look around this room. We're all here in person. We might have used social media and other forms of engagement to get here, but we all wanted to show up and be here for a reason, right? And so as long as we don't mistake the technology for the activism, we still have to do that engagement. When I think of three of the movements in this country that are just on fire right now. So think Black Lives Matter, think the Dreamers, think the Fight for 15 in terms of fast food workers. Those are all millennial movements that are all using social media to organize, but then to show up to places, to protest, to make demands. And I think we see that around the world. And so it's actually really, I think we're in a very inspiring moment because people are in motion and are doing things that are engaged and are holding our leaders accountable. 
Well, that's a great transition. As I mentioned earlier, Generation Progress has had a lot of meetings with young people uh, from different countries, and a lot of those countries are actually um, emerging democracies. And a question that I have gotten a lot is, how do I best set up a system for me as a young person to communicate with government? Um, and how do we ensure that no matter what country you live in, as a young person, you feel really engaged in government and you feel like government's working for you? Uh, what are some of your thoughts? Our, our survey actually dealt exclusively with uh, e European and North American democracies. Uh, so, and the, you know, the strange thing is when you get asked about, uh, about emerging democracies that our own are not so advanced in terms of engagement right now. You know, right across the board, people don't feel like they have that kind of political efficacy to, to, to make change happen. And one thing we noticed with the, uh, with, with the, the post-communist states in Eastern Europe Many of them felt that um, their parents' generation were much more politicized and engaged precisely because they had something to fight for. There was a, there was a transition ongoing. And one thing that kind of make, it makes one think that um, if people can actually engage with politics as a core of their identity, so we've seen it, like in the, in the embrace of advancing LGBT rights in Ireland, people saw this as something uh, to, to lay a flag in the ground, that this is what we want our society to be. Uh, and the referendum in, on Scottish independence also had a huge amount of youth participation um, on both sides of the divide, by the way. And it was a, it was a real debate over, not, it wasn't based on kind of ethnic nationalism or anything like this, it was a, over what kind of society people wanted. So if you can bring politics to the core of someone's personal identity and their societal one, that, that's, that's, where you, that's where you hit the mark, you know? Tom, during any last thoughts? Well, I'd say uh, a couple of things. One um, is to not forget local and state politics, whether it's here or in any country. Um, because media outlets tend to be national, because it makes international headlines, there's a tendency to follow it. Uh, for most people's lives in this country, the off-year elections, their city councils are going to affect their lives as much as a presidential race. Um, and it's the same thing that's true overseas. It's also a place, I think, where people who are just getting used to that engagement with government can sometimes get easier wins. Um, we've seen in a place like Baltimore what it means for a young person to run from, for office who might have a different perspective than someone else. And you can see that in a very tangible way uh, in local and state. Second thing, which also relates back to the other question, is to always remember that the loudest voices in the room, the first people to speak up, are not necessarily representative of a community. So whether you're going to engage with someone else's community or you're trying to engage, among other things, it will almost always be men who speak up first and often are not speaking for the community. Uh, I saw this in town hall meeting after town hall meeting when the health care fight was going on and I was in Congress, uh, or I'd go to any sort of meeting. The same sort of people would, would speak up at first, and you really need to pull out other voices or create forums where other people feel more comfortable speaking. So always be aware of those dynamics as well. So don't forget local and state, and don't forget that there are a lot of people who may not speak up initially, who may have a lot more moral clout and uh, networks in the community uh, that you can engage with. Just one, one quick last point about media. There's an interesting thing that's happened. There's been media consolidation. I happen to work for one of the big conglomerates. But then there's media democratization at the exact same time. And so make your own media, right? We now have the capability to make our own stories, to craft our own narratives, and then to upload them. Trust me, when the big media people when you think about the conglomerates, they are paying attention because you are the demographic they want to recruit to watch. They are watching everything you do, everything you film, record, make, upload. So you recognize your own power to make your own stories. All right, I want to thank David, Dorian, and Tom today. Thank you guys so much.